we uh, heard Anthony Townsend uh, talk about some of the key things for uh, smart cities, uh, the algorithms that advise policymakers uh, and advise decision making, um, but really the the or a key enabling technology and infrastructure behind all of those uh, possibilities uh, is open data. Um, open data is an area that Future Everything has been very involved in uh, over a number of years. Uh, going way, way back, uh, we were involved in the Open Street Map movement. That was you know, almost 10 years ago. And then in open data, in open government public data, uh, Future Everything has been very active since uh, 2009. Um, since then, uh, we've helped set up the uh, Greater Manchester Data Store uh, and really change policy in the Greater Manchester region. Uh, we've had data.gov.uk, um, we've had the London Data Store, and now we've had the establishment of a really major new body uh, in the UK, um, the Open Data Institute. Um, this is really what many of us have been looking for. Uh, and trying to do our small parts to, to work towards. Um, we hope it can be a game changer. Um, that's only going to load more uh, pressure and expectation <laughs> on someone's shoulders over here. Um, and we're going to hear more about both the, the scale uh, of that ambition, that opportunity, that challenge, I'm sure, as well. Um, Gavin himself, uh, as has happened a few times through this conference, is someone uh, who we've had uh, quite a long relationship with. Um, Gavin um, is an artist, he's a musician, um, he's worked at Jodrell Bank, uh, he helped set up Virgin Net, he's had 10 years uh, in, in startups, uh, and has joined uh, the Open Data Institute as the new uh, Chief Executive Officer. Um, so, Gavin's going to give you uh, an overview of that. He's going to touch on some of the themes we've been exploring in the last few days. Um, I know some of you in the room are from the City SDK network, uh, and we're together looking at how you create the conditions for a Europe-wide market for open data, how you create the sustainability, the scalability. Uh, the last few days, uh, Future Everything, in partnership with ODI, have run uh, a business of open data workshop about how developers, businesses can create sustainable services based on uh, uh, open data. We're going to hear the lot. We're going to hear about ODI, <laughs> the journey, the stories. Uh, so if I can welcome uh, Gavin Starks. Thank you. Th thank you very much. And. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with some stories. I think that on the, on the random walk that is my career, um, I think the last thing I would have expected would be to be standing here uh, running the Open Data Institute. I think nothing I've, I've done in my career ha has existed, in fact, when I was studying. And I was very fortunate to be working at Jodrell Bank uh, when the web first started to sort of get some traction and I set up their first website. And um, I thought it was quite an interesting thing to do over a lunch hour. Um, and obviously, 20 years later, uh, that's turned into, quite, the web's turned into quite a big thing. Um, the Open Data Institute, for me, is something of a privilege. Uh, I think I've watched the evolution of this space of, of not just web culture, but open data culture uh, emerge over decades. And you know, very much to Drew's point, we feel a, a huge responsibility uh, to take forward and, and the, the work that many people have been doing over that period. And we have a huge responsibility to, to take that forward. But I want to give you a bit of an overview of some of the things we've been doing, some of our background, some of the things that are happening, not just in the UK, but worldwide. And what we see is, is some of the potential. And I'll, I'll try and cut to stories uh, wherever I can. Please, if you want to ask any questions, just stick your hand up and I'm happy to be interrupted. Uh, we have an hour and it's an hour between uh, now and lunchtime, so do, do feel free to interrupt. So where, where do we begin? So we're very fortunate that Sir Tim Berners-Lee is one of our co-founders uh, with uh, Professor Nigel Shadbolt. And now we look at how do we take this one is I love this quote on the original paper that Tim wrote uh, f about the web which his uh, 
supervisor wrote, it's vague but exciting, you know, 1989. Um, turned out to be a bit more than exciting. But how do we take this web of documents forward into a web of data? And what, what, what does that mean? And we've already heard in the last session uh, some of the challenges when you start to bring together personal data at scale and uh, apply algorithms. I think that we haven't even really started to scratch the surface of some of the challenges and some of the opportunities uh, around this space. And one of the big things that's changed is this has moved from a grassroots initiative to a technology-driven thing to something where governments around the world are starting to drive the agenda. So you're having this very strange sort of a system where there's lots of bottom-up activity and not, there's also this top-down activity. And around the world, whether it's Obama, whether it's the Japanese Prime Minister, Taiwan has an open data portal, France has an open data portal. Governments around the world are very excited about open data as a way to drive transparency, to way, to, a way to drive good governance. Um, and put themselves under the spotlight. And in fact, when we launched, uh, formally launched the ODI in December, we had Francis Maud and Dave Willits uh, presenting to us. And one of the things that Francis Maud said, excuse me, was um, that he wants the ODI to hold government's feet to the fire on its commitments to open data. I take that very literally. Um, we will hold the government to account on its commitments to open data as much as we possibly can. Um, and I think that degree of commitment uh, is material and they have put their money where their mouth is in providing £10 million, £2 million a year over five years to the ODI to get started. And over that time, we have to try and generate our own income from different sources to be sustainable. But that money is coming through the Technology Strategy Board. So it's, it's public money uh, that is being directed to us and uh, we, again, have a huge responsibility to, to take that forward. When you look around the world, it really is an international movement. Uh, a lot of people in the room here will be familiar with Open Knowledge Foundation, with My Society, with projects like OpenStreetMap. But these, are, uh, these initiatives are happening around the world. And in the last, again, I, I formally started on the 1st of October last year. So this is month six of the organization. Um, we've had a dozen governments come and visit us. I had the uh, OECD in just this week saying, you know, how do we work with them to create open data standards and open data principles that can be adopted by the 35 countries that they represent. So this is a really substantial shift uh, in political motivation. Whether or not it's time limited, we will see. But I think right now, I think it, it, it's really a case that we need to push as quickly as we can and as firmly as we can into an open data environment. Um, and what do I, I suppose one of the big questions here, one of the things I get really excited about is what, what's the potential of open data? Well, we're in an era where we face some of the greatest challenges we've ever faced. We face massive social problems uh, around uh, population growth. We're going to grow to 10 billion people. We have massive economic issues as is evidenced almost on a weekly basis now with some part of the economy globally uh, running into trouble. We face huge problems in the environment uh, with climate change, water scarcity. Uh, and my view is that unless we really start to accelerate our open data efforts, we're not going to have the information and knowledge that we need to, to help address some of those problems. And it feels very much like the web in the mid-90s. I, I joined a very early Virgin Net. I was the fifth person in the team there, which is now Virgin Media. And then everybody was really excited about the web. It's going to change the world. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. And if you ask one person, they say, what's the value of it? They'd say zero. If you ask another person, they'd say infinity. Um, so you had a really broad spectrum of interest. and. In general, you had a lot of excitement, but nobody quite knew what shape it was going to be. And I'd say it's taken us 20 years to work out what some of that shape is. And it feels like we're in a very similar situation right now. Everybody is very interested in open data, and nobody quite knows what it means and what it's going to turn into. But there's some substantial differences between 
the mid-90s web and today is that we've already done the plumbing. We already have pretty ubiquitous access to the web, to the internet. Uh, we have internet-enabled devices globally, numbering in the billions, uh, mobile phones, laptops, sensors, etc. So we, we are at a very different starting point. You know, it took us pretty much a decade to get decent broadband penetration in the UK. But we now have that. We now have wired up that ecosystem. We have very powerful devices in our hands. So when we start to bring this new fuel or this new uh, infrastructure of data to market, it can move very, very quickly. So as you bring things uh, online, we can do a lot with them a lot faster. And I'll give some examples of that. But I thought it was interesting, again, in the last session, this mention of a trillion rows of data. I mean, that's, that's quite a lot um, in some senses, but it's not a lot in, in others. Um, but we are in an era where you can buy supercomputing by the minute. You know, cloud computing allows me to go onto Amazon Web Services or onto Rackspace and say, well, I'd like a whole bunch of compute power, but I probably need it for a minute or 10 minutes to run my analytics and then I'll switch it off again. So the cost of engaging with that uh, data uh, processing power it, it has come down dramatically. The cost of deployment has gone down dramatically. And there are examples where research institutions, for example, looking at a more traditional approach to large-scale computing would invest five million pounds in building a big data center to, or a big compute facility where they buy lots of servers and build it and run their analytics. And instead, they might just buy a couple of buildings worth of Amazon Web Service, Services for 40 minutes to do the same work. So you can do the work faster, cheaper, and that might cost 50,000 pounds instead of five million. So it's a really transformational change in our access to information and our access to infrastructure. I quite often get asked, what are the examples of, of open data successes? Well, the web is my best example. The web itself is a great example of an open data success. We simply wouldn't have Google. We wouldn't have Wikipedia. We wouldn't have services like Flickr if we didn't have an open web. And there's lots of challenges to maintaining an open web. Um, we need to also work to ensure that the web remains open and free. This is a really critical part uh, of the infrastructure. There's lot, lots of talk about creating a two-tier web. It's a terrible idea. Uh, and I encourage everybody to get engaged if you're not uh, already in, in helping to keep the web open. But open data isn't just about rebroadcasting data. It's about combining it. The power, a lot of the power of this information is going to be building and, and combining different systems. And it's about creating new uses. So if we take all the energy information and all the commercial information and all the uh, transport information. What could we do with our transport infrastructure? How could we refactor that to be more sustainable, to be more timely and relevant to citizens? And it needs to be credible. You know, the, the uh, Prime Minister has an iPad app at the moment. Uh, you may have read about it, where he gets sort of dashboards about what, how well the country's doing. And you have to ask the question, well, whose data is he looking at? <laughs> and very relevant to the last session, who wrote the code? What are the algorithms? Who's doing the processing? Which human or which algorithm or which genetic algorithm created the code? And is there a particular dogma in that code? And um, I think all of these questions we're, we're just starting really to, to ask. And it's only in the last few years, I think, that we've become generally aware of the amount of data about us as individuals that is being stored. Um, but it is vast, and it is uh, not often, all, not, not always with our permission as well. And I think there's a principle here that we have at the ODI is that personal information is not open data, unless you explicitly opt in. You have to explicitly opt in. But that isn't necessarily the case if you look at it at the open web. A lot of services, for example, Facebook will do automatic facial recognition and tag you in a photograph that somebody else has taken. And if you've seen any of the sort of backlash against Google Glasses, I think it's, in some ways it's almost comical. But we are starting to get a social awareness of quite how much information there is about us out there. 
just to begin and, and try and set a frame of reference for what we mean by open data. Open data has to embody a number of things from our point of view in order for it to be really useful. It's not just good enough to just put something out there. Putting it out there is a great start, but we have to have structured data somehow. The amount of information that's released is PDF file with embedded tables, which are not particularly well annotated. Basically, you have to have humans to interpret that to turn it into proper information. So it would be great to have a logical format and that it's machine readable. And this is happening. We are getting commitments from organizations, companies, private sector, uh, and public sector to structure their data. It has to be addressable. There has to be a URL. I mean, it might sound like an obvious thing to this audience, but um, the principle of creating a persistent URL that doesn't go away, that doesn't change too much so that you can always rely on the data being at that place is really critical. Otherwise, we can't find it, and we can't share it, and we can't build businesses on it. We have to license things. And it's really important that things have a license. If they're not licensed, businesses won't use the information. I'm not going to build an app or a service if I'm not sure I can use the data. And it doesn't have to be a black and white thing. If I have a doubt about the licensing of a bit of data, I probably won't use it. That's very important. It also has to be traceable. So we really encourage, strongly encourage, uh, the embedding of what is the source of this information? What's its provenance? There's some great uh, projects if you're interested in where did my data come from? It's about like, where did my product come from? What's the supply chain behind my can of Coke? Well, what's the supply chain behind my Prime Minister's iPad app uh, is an equally valid question. What's the provenance behind the clout scores that we were talking about just earlier? These are really important questions, and we are a very long way from really having a, a global infrastructure that supports this. There are some great technical solutions, things like the open provenance model, uh, which I would, again, if you're working in this field, really recommend. The final piece of this jigsaw is the data has to be continuous. And uh, we, we encounter this all the time. You, you have situations, even with Facebook, where they'll launch an API, people will come along, build an app, and then Facebook will cha change things. And that company, if they haven't preempted that or can't adapt, simply go out of business because their app breaks. The same situation applies to open data. If we don't have a continuity of supply, investors won't invest. Uh, people won't build things without some sense that the data is going to be around for, you know, at least give me a year to see if this works. Don't keep changing it every month or change your URL structure, etc. Government is particularly guilty of this in the past. If data is published and then it goes away and then it goes up somewhere else and then it disappears again. I think the work that uh, Government Digital Service is doing is fantastic in helping to uh, modernize the uh, way that government engages with the web. But there's a lot of work to do there and it applies to academic institutions, it applies to public sector, it applies to private sector. We have to have some kind of continuity of supply. And actually that last piece is one of the most relevant when you're trying to build a business around open data. Because if you're trying to provide a, a continuity of supply to a user, as a user, I'll quite happily pay for a service level agreement. And I have set up now two businesses on that basis. Uh, my last business was a, an environmental business, an environmental data business. And um, all of the data that we had there around how do you, calc how do you calculate the environmental impact of a company or a product uh, was based on public data. We brought it all together, gave it a persistent URL, added the provenance information, uh, made it uh, structured instead of being a PDF file or a spreadsheet, and then we charged for the, S the service level agreement, the SLA. We provided free access to everybody, and actually everybody used exactly the same infrastructure. So this is one of the interesting things. We had a cloud. Uh, infrastructure for all of the APIs and uh, ways of accessing the data. And companies like SAP or BP would come along and they would say, well, we want to use this, but we need a contract. And would, Great. Here is a contract. It will give you an uptime. It will give you a support uh, line, etc., and we'll charge you 
X thousand pounds per month for that service. But they were actually accessing precisely, exactly the same service as all the free users. So the business model can be completely detached from the value of the data itself. The, just the provision of data is enough to provide value. When we look at what, what are some of the values of open data, there are two broad categories. There's internal value. So you can start to increase the utility of information even within, our, within an organization. One of the questions that I've posed to government is, you have an internal uh, mechanism at the moment to go around all the different uh, departments and say, you must open up your data. And typically the question is, why? Who's asking for it? So rather than saying, please open up your data, I'd like to go around and start, ask, well, I have started asking the question, what's the most useful data set for your government department that you want from a different government department? Because then we can help create a demand chain, not just a supply chain. We can increase the utility of the information. We can improve usability. Uh, we can unlock some of the efficiencies in this. And I think the, the general rule of thumb, in, in certainly in government, seems to be a 90% saving if you start to really get standards in place, if you really start to use the cloud properly. You know, we spend something like a billion pounds a year on data centers in the UK, in the public sector. It's completely insane. You could build one for less than that. You know, it's, it's quite mad. Um, and looking from an external point of view, you get more users. And there's a lot of arguments here to say, if you open up the information, you will improve the quality of your own data. And that's a very important point. This creation of a supply and demand chain means that people who are users, who care about the quality, if they find a mistake, they will fix it themselves. And it is the power of many. I used to use this argument all the time uh, working in the music industry. When I was <clears throat> attempting to, uh, I suppose, from my point of view, state the obvious that digital rights management, DRM, is a complete waste of time because you have maybe 30 engineers writing the code and 300,000 people trying to break it. It doesn't work, and it's broken, and it creates a terrible user experience, which creates a barrier to purchasing rather than access to purchasing. And I could probably use that as another segue to go off into a little story. Is one of the companies that I ran uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we set up the digital supply chain for the independent sector uh, in the music industry. So we ignored all the majors, we ignored the EMIs and the universals. We just went to all the, all the indies. The indies represent about 25% of the music industry, and nobody had paid any attention to them. So we had to teach them what metadata was, what data was itself. Some of them had to buy their CDs off eBay so that we could get a good master copy and scan the covers, because they hadn't kept any digital copies. But the companies who really engaged in that process, we created a business which um, pulled together all of the core assets, the audio files, the right metadata, so not just the track name and the artist, the right artist name, you'd be amazed, Robbie Williams was spelled wrong in iTunes for about a year, um, the rights owners, and when we first started, iTunes was asking for maybe six pieces of data per track. We were giving them 40, and the difference between the business understanding, the sort of retail understanding, and iTunes at the time was trying to sell iPods, not sell music. Um, the level of understanding about that industry was kind of zero. What we helped to do is create the metadata standards that enabled an entire sector to move and engage online. So go ahead. Sure, it's Consolidated Independent, really catchy name. CI for short. Um, and by the time I left that business, it's still running. Uh, they act on one side, they have about 20% of the world's music coming in to a cloud infrastructure and can send music out to maybe 400 different retail outlets around the world, whether it's a Japanese ringtone provider, Amazon or iTunes. When Amazon launched their download store, we sent them a quarter of their store. This is a 15-person company in, at the top of Brick Lane in London. And I think you know, our nearest competitor, competitor, I think, was Sony uh, in terms of what we're doing. And we just outperformed them cons consistently in that sector by understanding 
the nature of that community and helping it to get online. The companies that engaged uh, with digital, we had to convince people that putting stuff online wasn't going to make the sky fall, um, now see maybe 60%, 70% of their revenues coming from digital. So there's a real shift, transformation of use of data and information. And opening up that information is, is really critical. We created a new supply chain in the digital world. One example, uh, we're, we're kind of short of really compelling stories about open data and the power of open data. And this is not just a UK phenomenon, it's a global thing. One of the first things that we did at the Open Data Institute is uh, we asked five startups to come in and sit in our space. We've got a 5,000 square foot office in Shoreditch. And we said, come and sit here. We're going to work out how to incubate you over time. I've almost finished working out what that is. Um, but we engaged in a project which brought together domain experts in the health sector, so people from the Open Healthcare Trust, uh, with, uh, sorry, people from Open Healthcare, the um, lo local healthcare trust, the NHS, doctors, Ben Goldacre uh, got involved as well. We brought them together with data analysts who could take all of the open data. Now, the, the NHS started releasing its prescriptions data last year on a monthly basis. And there's a lot of data. It's 35 million rows of data. And for someone like uh, Ben Goldacre, who's you know, reasonably technically competent, but he's still at spreadsheet level, it's a bit big for a spreadsheet. So you've got people who are, even though they're able to write code in a spreadsheet, they're kind of going, well, this is too much information. So we combined them with the data analytics people. They took out clinical exceptions around the drug class of statins. Uh, so they um, just, we just looked at one drug class. And what would happen, excluding those clinical exceptions, if you switched from on patent to off patent generic drugs, the, the price difference between a patented drug is, and, a, and a generic drug is maybe 20 pounds to 70 pence. So it's quite a big price difference. So if you said, on the clinical cases where it would make no difference to make that switch across the UK, how much money could we have saved in the last year if we'd given the information to the doctors and the patients and, and the relevant uh, parts of the ecosystem to make that switch. The saving was a bit surprising. It was over 200 million pounds in a year. I was completely gobsmacked by this. I had no, when we first started this project, I think it was week three, and I had no clue about healthcare, I had no clue about prescriptions. I was completely blown away by this because this is an analysis of all the data. It's not a model, it's not inferred, it's not a projection, it's a fact. We've taken out the clinical exceptions. This is all of the prescriptions that were issued last year. And if you look at the data and you do the analytics, they did this within eight weeks, a team of three people. They identified a potential 200 million pound saving for the NHS on one drug class. And we reckon there's probably six drug classes or more that you could do this kind of analysis on. And there is research out there to suggest that there could be a billion pound saving for the NHS. What we then did as the ODI was we said, well, this is a very interesting story. Well, we need to tell the story more broadly. So we engaged in a communications program around it. We got a piece, a very thoughtful piece in The Economist, a very thoughtful piece in The Financial Times, and The Guardian and Times, etc. covered it. And then it went to the Red Tops, the, the, the Daily Mails of the world. And that process was very important because we could have gone to the Daily Mails first, and you can imagine what the headlines might have been there, which would not have been particularly useful because we want everybody to collaborate and trying to solve the problem, not throw stones at each other. And this is a recurring thing. There's a lot of resistance to people wanting to open up data because it will change things. It might find things that you've done wrong. It might throw up errors that you've made in as, as an organization. So we have to create a permission space for people to fail and for that to be okay. And I think we can do that by focusing on problems and not people. And it's really critical part of this process. This story then flew around the world. I was, I sat down with the Japanese government about six weeks ago. They'd already heard about this story. I was like, oh, wow, this has been referenced in G8 reports. It's been referenced in 
open data reports that have gone to the French Prime Minister, Sweden, the US. And I was like, well, this is curious. I mean, it's great that we've got a fantastic story, but why is this the story? Why are there not hundreds of stories? So I think we collectively, as an open data community, have not done a good enough job yet of telling those stories. I had people come to me from the NHS and say, well, we did this analysis. And I said, well, great, what's the URL? Now, that, we, we, this is the beginning of a journey. Even with that coverage, what we've done now is we've got a project, we're trying to get the project funded at the moment, and it's hopefully, touch wood, it will happen, where we take it forward into a software as a service model for the startup company that can provide this intelligence to the healthcare professionals, work with the healthcare trust, work with the doctors, work with the IT suppliers that provide the information systems to the doctors, and create a behavior change program. Please. Can we just ask about the, the popularity of this? Yeah. Um, do you not think that might have something more to do with the fact that you've got someone like Ben Goldacre who's on the BBC and we've got an awful lot of money going into the ODI and to promote Absolutely. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons we're here. Look, come and use us. We, part of our mission is to try and amplify these stories. This, is, this was a very big signal to me. I learned a huge amount through this process. I need to know those stories so we can amplify them. We're taking another story right now and we're turning it into a film. Now that's part of our function is, and I'll come to that in a bit, is we're really looking for stories. Please come and tell me stories because I want to amplify them. Well, well, we'll go and get stories known. But there's an absence of these stories around the world. And I think there's a real, uh, we are kind of an amazing time this year. Right? So UK is uh, chairing the Open Government Partnership. Uh, that finishes in October. Governments around the world are really excited about this. So we've got to push while the going is good. Because I can guarantee you in a year, 18 months from now, ministers are going to be turning around saying, well, we spent all this money. Show me the results. Is this, uh, what's the value? What's our return on investment? not just the UK, but around the world, I guarantee this, this will happen. There will be a trough of disillusionment uh, in about you know, 12, 18 months. And we need to build up a real arsenal of evidence-based, compelling, emotive stories in, in that time. Isn't there a difference between the process and the, and, and the product? Because you can easily put the table here in place, but if you start to have an intelligent plan, it knows exactly what they want using that process. Yeah, well, the client here is, is kind of everyone, actually. So we took a leadership position to say, you know, we, we spotted this project happening, and I just went, tell me more about this. And then we started to wrap it into a program. So what we did is we brought the people together. We amplified what was already happening and then communicated it much more broadly. So I think it, there are lots of, lots of cases where... People might have an, an instinct or they might have some an indicative research that a thing is possible, but unless you really wrestle that out and put it on the table and get the right people around uh, to make it happen, um, I don't think it will happen. I think it needs, it's going to need a lot more proactive engagement, pro proactive disruption uh, over the next year until we build up a really good evidence base. Once we've built up an evidence base, everyone can point at the story and say, this is the kind of thing that's possible. I believe this is possible in this area. But we're not anywhere near there right now, in my opinion. So we need to build skills and capabilities. We need to build some expectations. We, we need to fail as well. We need to find some examples where this didn't work um, so that we can start to help people understand what the questions are. How can we identify where the savings might be? Where, how can we identify where the opportunities might be? So I think it, we're still at the very beginning of that journey. A, f a few notable exceptions. Yeah. Sure. I was talking at the LGA open data thing yesterday. I was obviously evangelizing open data and how it's solved. But there's a massive pushback against well, if we make the data open and somebody else benefits. Uh, sorry. Uh, basically, and someone else benefits from the uh, commercial opportunity. Yeah. Why should we be involved that's, in that? And that, that? That's a great, great question. Right. So, so I'll, I'll come back to that probably in a few different points in the, in the coming slides. But the basic principle is, 
if you don't have the resource to do the innovation yourself, why not give it to somebody else? And if they succeed, buy them, hire them. At least things happen. So there's people sitting on data assets at the moment that will continue to just sit there for decades because people simply don't have the time or the resource or the money to do something with it. And I'll come on to some examples, hopefully, where we'll uh, give uh, uh, at least directional examples of where I think this is changing. So let me come back to that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the, sorry, those resources aren't going to be completely unused and we all miss out as a result. Some of those resources, as closed data, are maintaining massive uh, you know, existing interests. Absolutely. And so we, we have a ex no, very current example of that is the postcode address file. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Which you may have in, your, in the front of your mind there. Uh, and the Royal Mail, you know, we're trying to sell the Royal Mail. It would be a little bit terrible if we sold our postcodes to a private company. It just boggles the mind. Now. Yeah, no, well, we're, we're on the case. We've provided uh, uh, consultation responses back on that. We're in directly engaged with the Cabinet Office. And our opinions are very well known uh, to the, the government and all that. So just in terms of whose opinions, Obviously, we have Sir Tim Berners-Lee as our president. We have Nigel Shadbolt as our chairman, and they are our co-founders, and they've done a remarkable job in getting us funding. It's a very important thing that they've done, apart from the creation of the ODI and, and lots of other things. But the ODI's governance, we are a non-profit private company. We're taking money through the Technology Strategy Board, but the Technology Strategy Board, the Cabinet Office, do not sit on the board of the ODI. We have autonomy in our governance. It's a very important point. We sit outside of government. We sit outside of industry. We have them as members in, in the case of private companies. We have them as funders in the case of uh, the government and uh, philanthropic investors. But our governance structure is completely autonomous. And that gives us a lot of power, I think, to, to affect change. I just want to bring to your attention Jenny Tennyson, who's our technical director, uh, who hates me saying this, but I believe she's one of the world leaders in open data and linked data. She's helped to create legislation.gov.uk and data.gov.uk, and has been writing all of the policy consultation responses for us that have gone back to government. I really strongly encourage, if you're looking at lobbying government, look at the way that she has done that, because we've had feedback now from the Cabinet Office that the way that she has provided th that response is incredibly resonant and they want to replicate it. So we've, even just in terms of the process of engaging with how do you affect change, there's some great examples there. They're up on the ODI website. Everything we do is obviously open. Um, have a look, they're written by Jenny. And if you want to get in touch about any particular issue, please email me or just get in touch and, and we'll work out how to, to help. Want to change? Uh, got 15 minutes there. Change uh, tack a little bit now and talk about data as culture. One of the things that I think is really critical about what we're doing is this is not a movement. It's not. Well, it is a movement. It's not just a movement. It's not just about business. It not, it's not just about government. We see this as a cultural phenomena. And in fact, the first thing that we did, uh, we launched in our second week, was a data-driven art uh, commission called. Data as Culture, which was uh, curated by Julie Freeman, uh, who spoke yesterday. We, had, we gave people two weeks to respond, a nice short time frame. We had 80 res 89 responses in two weeks from over 20 countries. And I think if there was any better indication to me that this is a cultural phenomenon, it was the response that we had at that time. And only one of the, we ended up commissioning nine pieces of work that sit in our London office. If you are in London, please come and see them. Um, only one of them screen-based. Everything else is either a kinetic sculpture or a mural uh, or a, a picture that uh, sits on the wall or a newspaper, the text trends newspaper that you have in your uh, delegate bags. Uh, we, that was one of the commissions that we created. Really diverse and also represented to me the web breaking through the glass. It's something that is becoming a per pervasive part of our culture. Uh, and this piece is a kinetic sculpture uh, where the 
faces, this, is, this obelisk here is a smart material that changes opacity based on search terms. So it's looking for search terms related to genocide, crimes against humanity, acts of war. So in the corner of our office is a little lighthouse that's reminding us how violent are we as a species? And I think this is a remarkably powerful piece to have sitting in the environment we have at the ODI, where we have, for example, the Open Government Partnership sitting every Thursday, helping to create policies around open governance and open data, just reminding everybody that there's some really big problems that we're trying to address. Our mission, actually our mission cha statement changed based on the commission. We changed our, the uh, mission statement of the ODI to include the word culture and how to catalyze the evolution of this culture. We changed the definition of value to not just being economic value and social value, but economic, environmental and social value. We are mandated to try and address these issues. What we're providing uh, and working on is we're working on standards, we're working on research, We've got training courses that we've just launched, um, short training courses, but not just for technologists. We've got open data for journalists, open data for lawyers, legal and licensing, open data for business models. We're trying to bring together world experts. This is not just a UK initiative. It's a global initiative to unlock supply in the public domain for not just public sector data, but also private sector data. This is not just about uh, governments are unlocking data. We're trying to unlock demand, so we're incubating businesses. Now, we don't take an equity stake in them, but we do provide space. We provide mentoring, coaching, sales support, product support. We've helped the startups, five startups sitting in our office at the moment. One of them is about to close its second six-figure contract. One of them has raised £250,000 venture capital. So we're starting to see some results. Those results are because the ODI exists. And when investors or customers come into the space that we've created, they're given that extra bit of confidence to say, OK, these guys have support. It's made a huge difference. And the third pillar, as I mentioned, is about communication. We need to communicate evidence-based, inspiring stories to help move this industry forward. I'm going to rattle through some examples now. Um, we've got about 10 minutes. Yes? Yeah, I've got them on the last slide. Yeah, and the slides, well, by the way, will be up on SlideShare um, as soon as I finish. Uh, the, looking at social value, we've had Al Gore say, you know, the internet's changing the way that we think. So what does data as, as culture mean? Does ubiquitous data change human behavior? Well, we just had a session where that was illustrated, the clout information changing the behavior of employers in a pretty terrible way, frankly. But uh, we have a lot of questions uh, to unpack there. How can we transform more products to services? We're seeing this, obviously, in the computing and, and IT world. We're also seeing it in the realm of vehicles, things like Zipcar, completely changing the way that products exist as services. How can we scale? Um, how can we deal with issues like population or education, law, housing, transport? Huge, huge areas for op of opportunity here to generate social value. A, a lot of the themes around uh, this conference, Osman Hack was here earlier. You know, personal data shadows is, is, is a theme that keeps coming back of like, what, what's the ambient information about us that we need to be cognizant of and careful of. And we've been asked by many organizations to get involved in the privacy debate and the, the privacy conversation because it has such, there's, there's such a powerful overlap in some areas between open data and privacy. And as I said, private information, personal information isn't open data unless you explicitly opt in. And if anybody is not doing that, then we'd like to speak to them. Um, when we look at environmental value, uh, I've spent six years working on climate change. Uh, I could give a very, very dark negative talk about that, but I won't today. But <laughs> Stern, who wrote the Stern report, which most of the world's policies are based on, said, oh, I got it, it's worse, actually. It's worse than I thought. 
So what are we going to do about that? So how do we open up map information? How do we up, open up land use information, weather information, water is going to be a massive issue, farming. These are all interwoven issues. And unless we start getting all of this information open, we're not going to be able to do very much about it. Similarly, with our economy, um, obviously we're all really delighted with the way that the economy is working at the moment. So how can we improve it? Um, transparent rules, this is something that governments really like until the lens is pointed back at them. And that's a you know, general case as well. Everybody wants everybody else to open up their data in the corporate sector and in the public sector, apart from them, because uh, they're all fine. Um, how can we make sure that this is self-reinforcing? So we're working on open governance rules, for example, which we will be implementing ourselves as the ODI. Open Corporates is one of the startups that sits at the ODI. We're very interested in how we can open up ownership information, who are the beneficial owners of companies, because that has a massive impact on the global economy. Where are the assets in the world? What are the supply chains in the world? Um, my previous company called Amy, uh, we're, we're just launching a environmental score, just like a credit score. We just launched one for every company in the UK now has an environmental score, 2.1 million companies. All of that is open data, so you can start to look at your supply chain and its environmental impact. And that's where you start to see these things coming together. How do you combine financial and environmental and social data together? Another question we get asked all the time, what about big data? Well, I don't really care whether it's big, small, medium-sized, massive, giant, whatever label you want on it. Can we just turn it into meaningful in insights? And it might be that we have to combine closed data with open data, with big data and small data and a whole range of different assets to create that insight. But the insight can be open. Now, we're working with the Department for Education. We've provided uh, feedback to them saying the National Pupil Database. Well, please don't make all of that open because it's got records for every single school child in the country. But there is information that you could make open that's derivative data that would justifiably be useful and genuinely anonymizable. And the anonymization question is a big one I'm not going to go into uh, just now. So. Coming back to the, the startup question, these are the startups we've got in today. Um, I'm hoping, assuming I get my own work done in the next week, that I'll launch our first version of our uh, startup program, which has been based on watching what these guys have been doing and iterating in my own knowledge of startups. And then that, we'll have a much more transparent process of how to get in touch with us about if you've got a startup that you want us to help with. We've got one beta, big data analytics company called Mastodon C. Placer, which has got all the transport data in the UK. Honest Buildings, which is trying to create a network of buildings, a bit like a LinkedIn for buildings, if that makes any sense. Locatable, looking at location-based services. So you type in your postcode, it tells you where the hospitals, the schools, the police stations, etc., are. And Open Corporates, who's, who've got data for over 50 million companies now. It's a three-person company. And I think I, love, I just love the fact that such tiny organizations can pull together all of the information in the world and provide some insight. Highlights of our growth, as I said, we've got 10 million UK public sector funding. Part of my job is to try and match fund that. So I think, you know, personally, I want to vastly exceed match funding. Within the first five weeks, we raised half a million pounds from the Amidiar network. It's a philanthrop philanthropic investment fund, uh, which was set up by one of the co-founders of eBay. Uh, the other thing we've done is started to unlock other funds from both the Technology Strategy Board and the Data Strategy Board. And this is not money that comes to us. This is money we've unlocked to give to startups. So if you've got an idea and you want to work with another company, you can get a £5,000 voucher from the TSB. If you want to take that forward, we've got an immersion program that will be launching. Well, it's, it's announced, but it will uh, go into production in a few months where you can get grants of up to 20 or 30,000 pounds to take ideas forward, what I call pre-seed funding. So we're trying to create this um, framework where you can come with an idea, you can take it forward, and then you can get some more funding, and then we can introduce you to the next level of funding. So we're working very hard on shortening the path for startups who have no time, and frankly, we want them to work on the ideas and not on the administrative side to get them fueled as quickly as possible. We've also signed a two-year deal with the World Bank to train the world's political leaders and national leaders, which I was 
can happen within two months of it starting. And it's showing the appetite that is out there for open data. So we're going to help countries create their own open data strategies. Uh, and part of that will be to create other ODIs in other countries. We've got five startups, as I mentioned. We've launched six courses. We've run a number of hackathons. We're sponsoring this event, so it's not just a London thing. I think it's really important. One of the first things I said, you know, we're based in the middle of Shoreditch, right in the middle of Tech City. Okay, that sends one good message and one not so good message. It really is about everyone. Uh, and I'm really keen to work out how we expand uh, across the country and around the world. We've now, we launched our own uh, membership model for private companies. So if you're a company, you can join the ODI. We've had 10 companies sign up in the last two weeks since we launched it. One of them Virgin Media, the other Witch Association. They're not just bringing money, they also want us to engage in research. They're bringing data. So Virgin is bringing us some of their web usage data and saying, what can they make open without compromising people's privacy? Really great example. And we've had over 1,500 people through our space uh, in the last four months. There's only 15 of us, by the way. Um, we've been quite busy. Um, but we're very excited uh, about uh, what is happening and, and the potential for what we're doing. So just wanted to leave with one call to action and call for help. One of the things that we identified, Jenny identified, right at the outset, at the moment there's a five-star rating system that Tim Berners-Lee created where you can assess the quality of an open data thing. It's filled a vacuum. What we've done is we've taken that forward into something that's much more robust, that's auditable, traceable, etc. It's currently in alpha. It's on GitHub. Uh, I put up a link there on Bitly. If you just go to bit.ly slash open data certificates, it'll take you through. It's in alpha. All of the development work that the ODI does, we do in the open. Even our tech team's chat room, company chat room, is an open IRC channel. So please join in. We're not tr sitting in some ivory tower somewhere. We're trying to bring together the community. We are funded to help bring together the community. Please come and talk to me. Please get in touch. And I very, very much look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Gavin. We've got just a, a few minutes for any questions. Um, so any questions from the floor? I can see one back there, another one here. Um, we've only got a few minutes, so I'll take those two together, if I may, first. So one at the back. Yeah, it's, it's on. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, yeah, great talk. Thanks, Gavin. Thank um, what are your views on a personal data cooperative whereby individuals would be incentivized to contribute their own personal data and maintain it for the benefit of the common good? That's really interesting. So I'd, I'd point at services like uh, MyDex, and uh, there's, a, there's probably a half a dozen companies trying to set up around personal data stores. And I think they're, they're starting to ask some really interesting questions and address some really interesting questions. There's a company up near Edinburgh who's, whose name I've, I've, I've forgotten, but the, there's a whole bunch of startups in that area. And I think networking with them is, is going to be a really good idea to try and create something like that. Do that would that, be great. OK, I'll have another go. Let's take uh, two questions, one here and one there. We'll take them together, if that's OK. Yeah, I'd just like to um, say thanks, of course, but also to ask about um, whether uh, or, or what you're thinking about the potential for risk for sort of distortion of the market through the ADI, because there's an awful lot of money gone into Shoreditch. And um, I, I welcome the fact that you, you, you were aware of that. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's this, this, the risk that it concentrates on very um, uh, few organizations. Yeah, I, and, um, you I, know, I completely hear you. So one, one of the things that I've decided to take on board myself is the notion of a rising tide can float all boats. And I want to see a net increase in the, in the total funding to everybody, not just at all focused at one place. And I think there's a role that the ODI might be able to play in helping to unlock more funding, but making sure that that funding then gets distributed to the right people. And we can act as a kind of router, if you like, for, for some of the funds. I was really delighted that one of the TSB catapults went to Glasgow, for example. Um, I'm very interested, and we we're talking with uh, Future Everything about you know, what can we do here? How can we make something happen? Because it, Manchester has been a centre for, for this stuff for a decade more. Um, so it would be insane not to 
try and just catalyze what's already happening. This is why our mission statement is catalyzing the evolution of open data culture, not becoming the world dominating institute for all open data. Uh, so please come and talk to us and, and help us work it out. If, if I may, Drew, just to, yeah. to add to that. Okay, just, a, just as a comment rather than a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'd be interested to see what happens with the, the commercial team and because like, I'm still worried that there's a risk of displacement there. Yeah, I, I hear you completely. Yeah. Okay, final question here. Fantastic presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. What is the attitude of China and how do you <laughs> see this developing? <laughs> um, so I was in Taiwan a month ago. Um, Taiwan has a number of companies in it that are providing a lot of cloud infrastructure for the rest of the world. There's a company there that makes something like three-fifths of all the computers in the world. They make a million laptops a week, a million tablets a month, a million servers a year. They make all the servers for all the names you will be familiar with. They have an open data portal, uh, data.tw or whatever it is, uh, gov.tw. Um, and they do all their manufacturing in China. Um, I know I'm not really answering your question, but I think there's an example there of there is an appetite to work out what the potential is. One example I've had is um, Singapore. Singapore uh, Singaporean government came to see us, and they have a horizon scanning program, probably one of the more terrifying meetings I had, where they just scan everything online all the time and try and work out where people are going to be doing things they shouldn't be. So it's a very different kind of use of open data, where they're trying to monitor you uh, rather than you monitoring them. Uh, I know Tim uh, gave a, a talk in Oman uh, recently as well. And again, the collective uh, male audience there had a very different attitude than we might expect from the Western world. So I think it's a very complex question. Okay. Thank you for that last question. Um, we'll wrap up there. Quick announcement uh, about lunch. On the white, in the white room, which is the seventh floor, there's the, uh, the book launch for the open book. Um, and there's also uh, a workshop by Natalie Jeremy Jenko, which is an addition to the program. It's not in the program, and she's fantastic. So, and there's refreshments. So lots of reasons to go up, up, upstairs. But uh, first of all, I'll ask you to thank Gavin for a fantastic talk. Thank, thank you. you.